Um, why don't we start? I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the Biotechnology Center, UW-Madison. I also work for the Division of Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, Wisconsin Alumni Association, and UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night by Zoom, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Titus Seilheimer with the Wisconsin Sea Grant. He lives in Manitowoc. And Titus, I'm going to ask you the five questions now. Uh, where were you born? Uh, I was born in Ladysmith, Wisconsin. Ladysmith? Towns, yep, town, uh, county seat of Russ County. And on, on the mighty um, Flambeau. That's right. Go Flambeau. That's where my first whitewater canoeing um, experience. Mine too. <laughs> Where'd you go to high school? Uh, I went to high school in New Auburn, uh, New Auburn, Wisconsin. So if you've read Mike, Mike Perry's books, I don't have to tell you anything more. Very good. And where'd you go undergrad? Uh, Lawrence University in Appleton. What'd you study? I have a bachelor's in biology. And then where'd you go for your master's or PhD? Uh, then I, I've got a finally a non-Wisconsin answer. Um, I actually moved to Hamilton, Ontario, and I uh, got my PhD in biology at McMaster University. Very good. Are you going to tell that joke now? Because it's a really good joke. <laughs> Which direction did you move to go to Ontario? Oh, so I, I actually moved south. Yeah. South to Ontario, south to Canada. And then uh, when did you, uh, oh, you post in... Uh, Oklahoma? Oklahoma, uh, New York, uh, then worked for the Forest Service, and um, I've been with uh, Sea Grant for almost eight years now. Very nice. So you could talk about something that's pretty intriguing to me about which I don't know a whole lot, um, but the history and the current status and that future outlook of commercial fisheries and the Great Lakes. I'm assuming you're going to talk about uh, primarily Lake Michigan and Lake Superior, but if you wander over into Huron and Erie and Ontario, that would be great by me too. Um, so um, delighted to welcome you to Wednesday night at the lab and I hope everybody else will say hi. And if you want to start off anytime, that'd be great. Thanks again, Titus. All right. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so yeah, I'm going to try to cover just, uh, you know, a few thousand years of time. And um, does that look good? Yes. See my screen. All right. So, uh, yes, thank you. So, uh, I am Titus Seilheimer. I'm a fisheries specialist uh, with Wisconsin Sea Grant, and I'm going to, uh, you know, give a, a kind of a description of um, how we got here uh, in terms of commercial fishing in the Great Lakes, specifically, uh, or most examples from Lake Michigan and Lake Superior. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, talk more specifically about some uh, research that I was involved with uh, that involved riding out on Lake Michigan boats and uh, counting fish, uh, which is what I like to do. So uh, first off, I always like to talk a bit about Sea Grant, um, you know, let people know what Sea Grant is. So, you know, we are here in Wisconsin, but uh, Wisconsin is one of 34 uh, sea Grant programs. And uh, if you look at the map here, you can get a feel for, you know, what's going on. And the trend or the pattern that I think you would see is that uh, we are on the coast. These are coastal states, have Sea Grant programs. And even though uh, we in the Great Lakes don't have a C, an SEA, we do have the Great Lakes, uh, which are uh, really from the very beginning of, uh, of the Sea Grant program, a little over 50 years ago, the Great Lakes have always been involved with that uh, and a part of the, the Sea Grant family. Uh, in the uh, smaller map on the lower right is, is really where we're at in the state of Wisconsin. We are based at UW-Madison. Uh, that's where our, our main office is, but then we also have, uh, we have field offices on the coast. So uh, for me, it's uh, uh, Manitowoc, but we also have people in Milwaukee and Green Bay and Superior uh, and even up uh, near Bayfield. Um, so we, we live in the coastal communities uh, and we, we also have uh, specialized areas that we work in. Like for me, that's fisheries. Um, overall, we, we kind of broadly uh, uh, work in extension, in education and in research. And 
you know, for me in my day to day, if I look at a month uh, on the job, I'm, I'm oftentimes hitting all three of those, uh, you know, th three sort of legs of the stool um, of Sea Grant. Um, and in addition to actually doing some research, we also fund quite a bit of research uh, where we get federal dollars uh, from NOAA coming into the state of Wisconsin. We request uh, research projects from uh, researchers in the state, uh, mostly university-based, and then we, we fund that research, uh, usually answering questions about uh, Great Lakes that are, you know, really driven by uh, what the concerns are about the Great Lakes and, and what uh, stakeholders might be interested in. Uh, in the middle there, there are four focus areas, and these kind of broadly across all the Sea Grant programs. If you were to go to uh, Maine Sea Grant or Alaska Sea Grant, you'd see these same focus areas. And, and so broadly, we're kind of working in, uh, you know, a lot of the same areas, uh, no matter what our, our system is. And, you know, for me, I, I kind of touch on all four of these, but fisheries is really my, my main area um, of work. Uh, in the Great Lakes, you know, why are we part of Sea Grant? Uh, we have a lot of coast. Um, Wisconsin alone has 820 miles of coastline. Um, I think that's that's a, an eye-opening num number for a lot of people. And if we look at just the, the U.S. side of the Great Lakes, uh, 4,530 uh, miles of coastline. And if we were to, you know, add that up, that's really sort of the Atlantic plus the Gulf Coast and about half of the Pacific over there. So, you know, we are truly a coastal region um, and a, a really special region as well. So I'm gonna, you know, get started talking about the history a little bit. And, you know, there, there's sort of an ecological history um, and also an icy history. You know, why are we here? Uh, formation of the Great Lakes. And that is of course related to the, uh, the glaciation uh, from the Laurentide ice sheet that really helped form uh, the Great Lakes. And, uh, you know, my sort of question here on the bottom, is this a long or a short history? And uh, really, when you think sort of the ecological age of aquatic systems um, for the Great Lakes, you know, it's maybe, uh, you know, 15, 20, 25,000 years uh, since, you know, these lakes were covered in ice to where they're at today. And when we compare that to you know, older lakes, if we go to the African uh, Rift Valley lakes, which are the, the African Great Lakes, you know, we're talking millions of years uh, of those lakes being in, in existence and, you know, much, uh, much more diverse sets of species, thousands of, you know, thousands of species in some of those lakes uh, compared to the Great Lakes, which are really a fairly young system. Uh, but it's also a, a fascinating system of, you know, lots of different ecosystems uh, which have developed um, in the last uh, several thousand years. Um, and within those diverse habitats, uh, we have these diverse fish species. And, you know, generally, uh, I just, I sort of love the Great Lakes, but I also throw a lot of fish, uh, fish examples in there. Um, and you know this, uh, the the picture there is just uh, one of those habitats. This is up in Georgian Bay of Lake Huron, uh, which is a really a, an amazing place uh, to visit. Coastal wetlands; um, these are one of those groups of habitats. And you know, to me, uh, a special place in my heart. That's actually what I I did my graduate work on, uh, working on coastal wetlands of the Great Lakes. And you know, I had the opportunity to travel to all five Great Lakes, both the US and Canadian sides, and, and see a whole range of wetlands from you know, a, a river mouth down in Lake Erie that's uh, you know, got a, a ton of uh, runoff coming in from a very agricultural wetland or watershed to a system like this picture here. This is Jumbo Bay in uh, uh, Lake Huron in Georgian Bay. We did a lot of work in Georgian Bay. And you can see the, you know, there's these submergent plants here. Those are uh, scurpus. Uh, under the water, which you, you, know, you can't see with the glare, but there's a diverse set of uh, submergent aquatic plants and it's all very interesting habitat. It's very diverse um, and it, it really becomes uh, home to a lot of different species. And you know, this is just a, a little sampling uh, of some of the, the resident fish we might see, that big fish in the middle, that's actually a bowfin, which uh, you might, might have heard of as a dogfish, uh, but a, a pretty common wetland uh, resident in the Great Lakes. Uh, smaller fish there, and 
you know, wetlands are important, uh, you know, not just to the, the species that are sort of in those areas, but really to about three quarters of all the fish species in the Great Lakes. They're either, uh, you know, using wetlands as spawning a nursery habitat or their, uh, you know, their food source is using wetlands or they're, uh, you know, going into feed. Uh, so really a, a important habitat to a lot of different species. Uh, also, you know, for, for habitat and for fish, uh, the rivers and streams, I like to think of these as the, you know, really the sort of the highway that connects uh, the Great Lake to the watersheds. Um, and, you know, in a lot of cases, these, uh, you know, rivers and streams historically would have, you know, fish would have had the ability to swim up through these systems uh, into the very headwaters and, you know, very far uh, from the lake itself. And for, for species like uh, the spring migration of the white sucker, um, you know, these species are actually taking this energy that they're, you know, they're getting while they live most of the time in the Great Lake. Uh, so these, these fish were out in Lake Michigan uh, for most of their lives. Now they're returning in the spring to, to head upstream and to feed. And so it's, uh, you know, it's similar to the, the examples we might see on the West Coast where we're talking about salmon uh, bringing ocean-derived energy up into these headwater streams. Uh, same thing we see in the Great Lakes with things like sucker. Uh, other interesting habitats, uh, beaches in the near shore. Uh, you know, beaches are really the, the easiest place and the most accessible place for us uh, to experience the, experience the Great Lakes. You know, we can uh, just go to a beach, uh, you know, there, there's swimming opportunities, there's just, you know, watching the, watching the lake change, watching the waves. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I can't say enough for really the value of these public, public access sites. And, you know, they, they also have, you know, these fishery roles, things like uh, if anyone's, you know, smelt, uh, rainbow smelt runs. Uh, this is a, a picture from uh, near Duluth from Minnesota Sea Grant, but, you know, springtime uh, rainbow smelt, which are actually uh, an introduced species into the Great Lakes, uh, but they are, you know, coming into shore uh, at night. They're coming into these rivers and streams. Uh, to spawn and people are out there on the beach uh, spending their time filling up buckets full of these smelt uh, and then they're they're frying them up uh, and you know for us in in Lake Michigan uh, historically you know lots of people uh, around Manitowoc and and other coastal towns remember the time when there were big uh, smelt runs in Lake Michigan as well but really our food web has changed uh, to a, a degree that that we don't see as many smelt uh, close to shore anymore uh, and then there's the offshore. There's sort of the, the deep water parts of the lake. Uh, if you think of, you know, sort of most of the Great Lakes are, are these deep areas that, that we might not be able to directly uh, uh, interact with. But what I'm going to talk about in this picture here is, is actually a, a trawling net uh, harvesting a school of uh, lake whitefish. And, and that's the, the sort of applied research that I'm going to talk about a little later on. Uh, but you can get a, a feel for, you know, what the lake would look like uh, right here. We're down about 100 feet uh, deep. Uh, we've got a sandy bottom here. There's, uh, you know, those darker spots are actually uh, quagga mussels mixed with uh, cladophora, which is an algae and are, are all things that are going to kind of uh, play into the, the story that I'm going to tell about uh, the, uh, the applied research side of things. Uh, some of those other offshore deep water species, uh, species like the lake trout um, and the habitats like these rocky reefs that you can see uh, in those pictures. And then uh, the lower left, uh, the uh, species like the cisco, or uh, you may uh, know the name lake herring, but uh, we call it a cisco now. Uh, it's actually in the whitefish family. And, uh, you know, these are, are fish that are spending their time sort of offshore or in deeper water. Uh, and are an important part of the, the food web. So that's, you know, uh, sort of some of the, the habitats that we have in a nutshell uh, throughout the Great Lakes. Um, and what we're going to jump into now is, is look a bit more about that history um, in terms of fish as a food source, because I think that is uh, really an important uh, sort of story. Uh, you know, certainly we're going to talk about today's fisheries, but, uh, you know, I think this, this historical perspective is also uh, an important part of the story. Uh, really, as long as uh, people have lived on the shores of the Great Lakes, um, you know, there has been a, a, an active fishery and the lakes have been an important food source. Um, 
there is archaeological evidence of, you know, at least four or 5,000 years of active fishing in the Great Lakes. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a, a long time uh, to have the lakes be important, probably longer than that. Um, over that time, um, lots of different fishing gears have been used. Uh, you know, I think in Wisconsin, we're, we're generally uh, familiar with spearfishing, um, and there's certainly tribal spearfishing that's still going on today. Uh, but you know that that's a type of fishing that uh, has been around for a long time. Also, uh, gaffing, so basically a, a hook, a big hook on a stick, uh, gaffing those fish, hook and line, as well as weirs. So building structures in places like rivers to kind of uh, concentrate the fish or uh, you know kind of force them into a, a, a blocked off area that they can be harvested. Um, and you know I think the thing to note about those uh, sort of early gear types is they're very hands-on and they're, you know, really, uh, if you're spearing a fish, they need to be close. Um, if you're gaffing a fish, they have to be close. And, uh, you know, I think part of that is, is really the, the seasonal reliance um, and, and especially spawning, spawning movements of these fish species, uh, you know, really an important life stage. Uh, so if you think, uh, you know, five or 6,000 years ago, you've just been through winter, uh, you've, you've kind of eaten all your uh, preserved food that you had stored from last year. And then, you know, here comes that spring spawn, the, the, the things, you know, large species like uh, sturgeon, uh, like the, the walleye or uh, the, the suckers, uh, moving in in large numbers, concentrating together in shallow water. And, you know, for a, a species like sturgeon today, you can, you, you can go out to the Wolf River in the spring and walk along the sturgeon trail and you know the the fish are right there they're you know on shore you could basically just pick them up uh, so you know an important food source uh, you know very seasonal food source but very important um, right around 2000 years ago 300 to, to 200 BCE uh, nets arrive and that's that we're, we're kind of talking gill nets there uh, into the upper lakes and when I say upper lakes I'm talking uh, Huron Michigan and Superior um, and that, uh, you know, along with uh, technology like birch bark canoes, allow people to kind of, you know, get out into the lake or get farther offshore uh, and set, set nets and uh, harvest, uh, harvest fish in a, a, you know, kind of different, different way. Uh, you know, because we are in the, the Midwest, uh, uh, copper is, uh, you know, fairly, fairly abundant and available. And, you know, here's a a copper fish hook from uh, 3000 to 1000 BC. Um, and that's, you know, part of that hook and line fishery that's been around a long time. Uh, this is a, a painting from uh, Paul Kane, 19th century artist and uh, spearfishing on the Fox River. Um, and, and what I like here, it, it sort of starts to give us a feel for, you know, so the evolution of different technologies. So we have, you know, the, the birch bark canoe, there's a, a spear uh, with the flame baskets in front and, you know, the flames there kind of attract the fish uh, and, and they're very obvious and then they can be speared. Uh, but the interesting uh, sort of thing about this painting is those, those baskets are actually made of iron and uh, the, the tribal fishers here have actually traded for those baskets with the, the traders, the European, uh, you know, traders, uh, to get that new technology. And really, as we look at uh, sort of the evolution of these fisheries, uh, whether it's tribal or whether it's, uh, you know, other commercial fisheries, uh, it's really adaptation and using new technologies as they come up. Um, and then, uh, you know, just a, another example here uh, is sort of the netting of fish. And, um, you know, location-wise, I'm not sure where this is, but, Definitely, uh, you know, one of the areas where you know netting whitefish was really important was in the St. Mary's River. So near Sault Ste. Marie, uh, there's the the rapids there, and you could kind of paddle your canoe up into the rapids, and then uh, dip these fish out and and fill these boats up. So uh, just a you know uh, an example here of this uh, sort of getting those fish when they're when they're in shallow water close to shore. Um, you know, our, our story sort of evolves over time. Uh, you know, that was the, the tribal side, but then the, we have the, the settlement of the Great Lakes, new arrivals come in, uh, you know, the explorers, missionaries, and traders first. 
but then as the Great Lakes are settled, uh, there's the sort of the, the people with commercial fishing history that, that come into the Great Lakes, bring that from you know, places like uh, Scandinavia or you know, places in Europe where they had fished in the ocean and now they bring that, that experience and technology into the Great Lakes as well. Um, so our Great Lakes fishery really evolves over time uh, and, and, and we can follow that, those changes through uh, you know, differences in fishing gear type. So uh, you know, early on, 1830s to 1850s, beach stains are really sort of the dominant way to fish. And you know, the advantage there, uh, they're simple and cheap. Uh, what a seine is, it's basically a, a long net weighted on the bottom, floats on top, that you would take from the shore, make a big loop, um, and then pull both ends in to shore. Uh, you concentrate those fish, you haul those out, and, and you sell those. And so, you know, maybe a boat is involved to, to run the seine out. Uh, maybe you're using horses to, to pull that net up onto the beach. But it's, it's a fairly simple gear. Uh, you know, it's not offshore. You're not really worrying about getting caught in storms. Uh, but as, you know, as that's a dominant fishery, uh, those uh, kind of near shore, easily accessible fish populations start to decline first. And as, as you know, the catches go down, uh, the, the commercial fishery has to shift to new waters. And, and what they do is they shift offshore. Um, less reliance on seines, and then they move to things like pond nets, uh, what they call them uh, in Manitowoc area, pound, or pond nets. They're actually pound nets. Um, and you know what, the picture on the right there is actually a, a pond net. Uh, you can see that the net stakes are actually, you know, these kind of long uh, straight trees that are pounded into the, the bottom of the lake. Uh, and then the net uh, that pound uh, is hung around that those poles. Then there's a a, a lead that'll uh, the fish kind of run into. They go into the pond, the pound, and then they're sort of stuck there. People in the sailboat there are you know sort of gathering the net up, concentrating the fish, and then netting those. Um, and so that is uh, you know was was common in certain areas. Lake Lake Erie had a lot of that in the. Parts of Wisconsin, if you actually look at our nautical charts now, you'll see net stakes um, on the charts. And so there are still these, you know, remnant pieces of, of these uh, basically trees that were pounded into the bottom, um, sticking out of the bottom uh, of the lake bed. Uh, generally close to shore because, you know, your trees need to, to reach above the, the surface of the water. Uh, but also gill nets become important. And, and you know, gill nets are, you know, have been really developed throughout the world at different times. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about what, what gill nets are uh, when we talk about kind of our current fishery gear, but they've been around a long time. Uh, lots of fishing heritage around the Great Lakes. Uh, this is a, just an image from Isle Royal uh, out in Lake Superior and Isle Royal historically just sort of dotted with these different uh, family, uh, uh, family home fishing village type areas all around what is now a national park, a place we would go to experience wilderness was historically, uh, you know, this really important kind of hub out in Lake Superior. Um, and I've, I've met the, the last, uh, uh, last fisherman who uh, up until a few years was still uh, able to fish in the, the waters of Isle Royal, but the, the park service has uh, uh, kind of put an end to that. Uh, when we look at uh, the, the fishery over time, we can also look at, you know, sort of how the, the technology or the boats have changed uh, early on. Uh, the, the sort of workhorse vehicle of our commercial fishery in the Great Lakes were these uh, small sailing vessels called Mackinac boats. Uh, there's still some, you know, from the, the historians, there's sort of argument on how, you know, what a Mackinac should look like, how they were built. Uh, you know, the, these were built without plans. There's not a lot of documentation that still exists. Uh, but there's, you know, if you go to a maritime museum, you might uh, be able to see at least a, a reconstruction of what these Mackinacs look like. But, you know, what we're looking at, it's a fairly small boat, two-person crew. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're going to rely on wind, they're going to be close to shore, that's going to influence kind of where and how they can fish. Uh, it's also going to be early on, it's a, a very, you know, it's a, a very physical activity. Uh, you know, nets are set by hand, 
they're uh, retrieved by hand. So um, whereas today we might have a, a hydraulic net lifter to pull a net up from 400 feet, uh, in the past, you know, people weren't going to set nets that deep. Uh, lots of uh, changes and, uh, you know, improvements to the, the fishing boats over time. Um, uh, you know, we go from sail to steam power into gasoline or diesel engines after that. Uh, this is a boat going into the harbor in Racine. And, you know, you can, you can see the, uh, you know, sort of mostly enclosed uh, boat at this point. There is sort of an open work, work area at the back of the boat, but most of that boat is uh, enclosed. And what we start to see is sort of the evolution of a, a fairly uh, distinctive Great Lakes uh, fishing boat style called the fish tug. Uh, and, and this is two, uh, two boats uh, outside of Bodine's at Bayfield. And, you know, it's a totally enclosed boat. It can fish in pretty harsh weather. It can go out in winter um, and, uh, you know, be able to be out there uh, most of the year. But, you know, when we talk, uh, we talk about the value of the fisheries to communities, it's not just, you know, what was the dockside value of your catch? It was really, uh, you know, that was important. And that, you know, the, the commercial catch was important to these uh, coastal communities and fishing villages, but other industries were important as well. Things like uh, shipbuilding and boat building, uh, you know, places like Manitowoc, uh, you know, have a long history of, of uh, you know, boat building, burger boats, still here. Uh, they're not building commercial fishing boats anymore. They are building uh, research boats for the Wisconsin DNR and for uh, US Geological Survey. Um, but, you know, a lot of these industries got started in, uh, associated with these uh, commercial, commercial industries because the boats were built locally. Uh, Karen Net Company in Two Rivers, Wisconsin, um, you know, they started out as a, a company building nets for the fishermen. Um, as that, you know, the fishery changed, um, you know, that became less important to their business. Now they don't do any commercial fishing net manufacturing, but uh, a few years ago, the NCAA Final Four were using uh, uh, Karen nets in their, for the, the rims uh, in the, the basketball tournament. Uh, if you go to a gym and they pull that big net between the, the different basketball courts, that might be a Karen net. Um, so started as, uh, you know, supporting the fishery uh, still in these communities and still, uh, still making nets, but not, not associated with uh, the, the fishery anymore. And then, uh, you know, kind of another example, Collenberg, uh, lots of these early fishing boats uh, when they went to gas and diesel engines, had Collenberg, two cycle engines in them. Um, not a lot of, you know, really there aren't any Collenbergs unless they're sort of a museum piece. Um, an example of a Collenberg in use in a, an old fishing boat, but not being used for fishing. Um, and Collenberg is still in two rivers, uh, but they, they shifted from engines to uh, things like horns. So uh, if your hockey team scores a goal, uh, the horn, the siren might be a Collenberg horn. Uh, if you're out kayaking and an aircraft carrier honks at you to get out of the way, uh, well, one, you're in trouble, uh, but two, uh, that might be a Collenberg uh, horn as well. So started in fishing um, and, you know, it's still uh, important in the communities, but not associated with fishing. Um, and then we have the harvest his history. And, uh, you know, really it's a, a story of change. It's a story of shifts through time. Um, mostly when we look at Great Lakes, and this is uh, specifically a Lake Michigan commercial landing, uh, kind of adding together all the, the different states in Lake Michigan uh, from 1879 up to 2014. That's the, the period that we're looking at. Um, and there are other species uh, that we have data for, but these are, I think when we think food fish, high value fish, um, these are the species. And what we have is a, a sort of the story of shifts over time in different species. So early on, Lake Whitefish is, that's our species. And that's this, uh, the purpley area down here. Um, that is Lake Whitefish. So 1879, uh, you know, half that harvest is Lake Whitefish. And that is a high value 
you know, very valued fish as a food source, uh, you know, probably twice as much whitefish than lake trout is being harvested. Really half the fishery at that point is, is lake whitefish. But as uh, whitefish shifts, um, you can see that orange uh, expand and that's a shift into ciscos, things like uh, cisco or lake herring and the other deep water uh, chubs or ciscos. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these names are, there's a lot of overlap here, a little confusing, but basically we're looking at a cousin of the whitefish. Um, they're both in the Corrigonus genus um, and they, you know, really expand and there's a, a lot of harvest, you know, we're looking at 20 plus million pounds in the, the late 1800s, early 1900s um, from Lake Michigan. Uh, green there is lake trout. Lake trout's important. There's a big yellow up on top. That's the, the yellow perch. There is, you know, there is always a, a whitefish harvest uh, that's happening. And then down on the bottom, that purple, that's uh, the chubs um, as well, uh, which is a, a different deep water cisco, the Corrigonus hoi. Uh, you might know them as smoke chubs uh, or bloaters. Uh, our lake trout there, uh, our, our fishery is, you know, it's present and then it, it basically disappears 1949, 1950. And what, what happens, and I'll go into that story a bit more uh, in a little bit, but uh, lake trout are, are no longer a, a big factor in Lake Michigan in the mid 20th century. Uh, our deep water ciscos, our, our uh, lake herring decline, that, that orange kind of goes away, uh, but the smoke chubs or the, the hoy are, are you know, really becoming a big portion of the fish, uh, you know, then that's uh, sort of post-World War II, uh, there's a bit of a boom, then a decline. Um, but then we have uh, this uh, re resurgence of Lake Whitefish where, uh, you know, whitefish become important, more important than really most of the fishery now. Uh, chubs were, were definitely there uh, kind of 80s and 90s, uh, you know, a, a big portion of that fishery were chubs. Uh, people, I think, remember that that chub fishery and the smoke chubs. Uh, and I, I guess the other sort of important, that brownish color is, is the smelt, uh, and they're sort of various degrees through time and importance. And then the yellow perch as well, which uh, actually uh, the Lake Michigan perch fishery closes uh, in the, the mid 90s. And uh, there is still a remnant fishery, but it's really only in Green Bay. And, you know, a lot of our more recent stories uh, we can look to things like food web change from uh, non-native species. So overall, you could say, you look at the graph, uh, just sort of a decline uh, overall. Uh, maybe that's not the whole story though. Uh, you know, I think one of the, uh, since the 1960s especially, uh, you know, there's been a, a sort of a, a shift in, in what the lakes have been managed for. Uh, you know, historically, it was really a commercial harvest management scheme, um, you know, fish were harvested and then they were sold and people ate them. And now uh, really uh, a lot of the effort and a lot of the money is, is on the recreational harvest side. So trout and salmon. Um, and, you know, it, in, in a lot of ways, uh, if you pay money to a charter fishing guide to take you out on the lake, uh, help you catch fish, uh, they clean the fish for you and you go home with fish. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of similarities there with uh, with a commercial fishery. So, you know, I think that that is also part of the, the equation that we don't really see in these commercial landing data. Uh, but, but there, you know, there's also these, uh, you know, sort of side stories and interesting uh, things that have happened in the food web. Uh, a lot of this is related to invasive species. And we're gonna, we're gonna revisit, uh, you know, the graph of the, the harvest but we're going to look, we're going to add some a different species and actually see a, a sort of a different story. So here we have sort of a, a cascade in the food web where uh, sea lamprey ar arrive into Lake Michigan, Huron and Superior in the 1930s. Uh, they are native to the North Atlantic. Uh, they are parasitic, so they attach to fish like the lake trout and they uh, feed on their, their blood and fluids. Uh, pretty high mortality for a lake trout if you, you have a lamp feed on you. And really, as, as we see with a lot of non-native species into the Great Lakes, uh, they sort of escaped their natural predators and parasites and they do really well uh, in the Great Lakes. So um, what we're gonna see actually by the mid 20th century, Lake Michigan uh, lake trout are essentially extinct from Lake Michigan. 
Um, and you know, if, if you've been out fishing recently and caught a lake trout, that's really uh, decades of, of stocking and restoration work. But uh, you know, we have essentially no top predators left by the mid 20th century. Uh, we have that sort of unregulated fishing uh, also played a role in the, the lake trout demise as well as uh, pollution and habitat destruction, but lamprey played a big part of that. Um, but from the fishing side, uh, those uh, forage fish, the prey fish out in the lake, things like the, the cisco, deep water ciscos, uh, they're sort of small fish, they're eating plankton, things like zooplankton, and uh, lake alewife, which arrive also a North Atlantic uh, native species, um, but uh, like the sea lamprey are able to go into freshwater to spawn. Um, they arrive into Lake Michigan, uh, sort of early 20th century as well. And they find uh, sort of no competition from other fish, very few predators up above. And, uh, you know, they sort of explode in population. And so uh, the, the picture I showed earlier of, you know, all those dead fish, those are dead alewives. Um, Alewives have the, the tendency to sort of die when they come into spawn. Um, and at their peak, 90% or nine out of every 10 pounds of fish in Lake Michigan were alewives. And, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it was, that is not a, a picture of a very balanced lake. Uh, so this dominance by this uh, uh, invasive species and actually led to uh, a few of the different things that have shaped the lake to get today and that will uh, also be part of the, the story that I'm gonna tell about applied research coming up. Uh, it created a commercial fishery, but also led to uh, the stocking of salmon. Um, on the commercial side, so you know, basically there was a very abundant uh, of fish in the lake and you know, there were opportunities to capture it using things like this is a pond net in action, uh, you know, just dipping out pounds and pounds of these alewives, um, but uh, a very low value fish. So not a not an eating fish like a lake whitefish, uh, something that's going to be used for uh, pet food or fertilizer. Um, so one to two cents a pound compared to, uh, you know, nickels, dimes, uh, even dollars a pound uh, for a food fish. Um, and also led to uh, the use of bottom trawl technology uh, to harvest them uh, as an efficient way. So if we look at, if we look at this graph again, but we add in the alewives, uh, sort of a different picture. It'd be harder to say, oh, it's a, a decline in the commercial fishery. Well, if we add alewife, we actually have a few years with 50 million pounds of alewife being harvested. You know, very low value, but uh, you know, part of that story. Um, also, when we you know, kind of look at the management of the lake today, uh, you know, because there was this abundant food source, uh, the state of Michigan, uh, Dr. Howard Tanner, um, you know, really was given the task of find a species to put into Lake Michigan, take advantage of this food, and create a sport fishery. Um, and, and the report there is coho salmon for the Great Lakes, 1966. And this is the, the first stocking of coho salmon uh, kind of rapidly followed by the, the stocking of Chinook salmon. And these are both uh, Pacific native species uh, that are anadromous. Uh, so they return to fresh water and were able to survive in the lakes. And uh, you know, coho actually spend more time in the, the hatchery. So uh, Chinook became sort of the preferred species because you could collect the eggs in the fall keep them in the hatchery until the spring and then let them go. And then in three or four years, uh, you'd get a, a 10, 15, 20 pound fish coming back. Um, so, uh, you know, these, these specific salmon, especially uh, very efficient at feeding, growing, and uh, uh, important to the, the sport fishery. Um, other things like steelhead, uh, rainbow trout, brown trout, all have become important parts of our Great Lakes fisheries. Um, and, and, you know, so, Really, when we talk fisheries in the Great Lakes, it, it is definitely uh, important to remember that recreational and charter side uh, that has a, a really high value um, and a high harvest as well. But uh, if you're, you know, going to the grocery store looking to fish, uh, you know, buy some fish or buy local fish, uh, it's not necessarily going to help much. So. Now I'll jump into really what does today's commercial fishery look like? Because it is, you know, it is much smaller than it was historically. 
but you know, certainly as a food source, it's important both locally and really throughout the country. Uh, we ship a lot of fish to New York, uh, to the smokehouses out there. Um, and it, you know, it is a very valued species, um, Great Lakes whitefish. Um, also important though, the, the lakes have really changed. Uh, and a, a lot of that change, things like zebra and quagga mussels uh, have, have really made, uh, you know, changes how the, how the lake functions, how uh, fish populations are doing. And that, you know, is also something to kind of remember um, that, you know, it's, it's a pretty challenging job to be out there uh, harvesting fish. For us in Wisconsin, um, Lake Whitefish is sort of our, you know, this is our top fish species in, in our Wisconsin commercial fisheries in the Great Lakes. Um, if we look at, uh, you know, sort of numbers wise for all of the Great Lakes, and this is just a, a chart here where I'm gonna pull out Lake Whitefish. And in terms of poundage, at least in 2013, poundage and value, um, and this is both US and Canadian harvest, uh, Lake whitefish is the top species. Uh, another bit of a, a caveat there though, um, when we look at the next five species, perch, walleye, uh, smelt bass, uh, and white perch as well, uh, that's Lake Erie's fishery. So although Lake Erie has the largest fishery and re really probably more than half of the commercial harvest is coming out of uh, Lake Erie and that is uh, a lot of that is due to the, just the productivity of Lake Erie. There's lots of nutrients, it's shallow, it's warm, uh, it's able to produce a lot of fish. It's also uh, perkids, things like perch and walleye, which can be harvested earlier. Um, some of our Lake Whitefish might be 10 or 15 years old. Um, so just uh, produc production wise, um, our colder, deeper lakes uh, produce less fish. Um, this is, this is sort of the, the picture of Lake Michigan's uh, commercial fishery right now, uh, 2015 numbers, but, but pretty similar to what, it, what it's like today. If we look at pounds, over 90% of that harvest Lake Whitefish, uh, there is some yellow perch there and that's uh, coming out of uh, Green Bay. There's a small uh, harvest, both of these species, perch and, and whitefish, they have, you know, they're, they're tightly managed, there's a population model that's run, safe harvest uh, uh, levels are determined, and then uh, those, uh, the, the people with, with uh, uh, commercial fishing licenses and quota uh, get an allocation of that, that quota. So, you know, really, uh, I, I think, you know, in general, US, uh, US fisheries are, you know, pretty, pretty tightly managed, and I think with an eye for sustainability, and you know, in, in general, uh, you know, looking at, looking for U.S. produced fish is a, you know, a pretty sustainable decision. Uh, we got a few other species, chubs up there, um, uh, which uh, historically, you know, would have been millions of pounds coming out of the lake, but uh, you know, really that's a food web issue. Also with the perch, uh, the food web has changed and hard, it's kind of hard times for those fish. Uh, and then we have the, the burbot there as well, which is actually the only freshwater cod species. Um, if we move up to Lake Superior, a little different story here. Uh, we actually have the Cisco or Lake Herring harvest is in terms of pounds, and that's actually happening right now. If you go up to Bayfield, uh, this is when Cisco are spawning and they actually harvest them at spawning time because the, the driver of that, that fishery is the, the row or the eggs. Uh, which are uh, removed and, and sent overseas. Scandinavia uh, has a, a real desire for those that row uh, turned into caviar. And you know, that sort of drives the fishery. Uh, Lake whitefish is a smaller percentage there in terms of pounds, but value wise, it's about uh, nearly half of the value of the Lake Superior fishery in Wisconsin is from whitefish. So it's a high value fish. And that's uh, you know, another thing to, to think about. What's the value of these species? Uh, now I'll, I'll kind of jump through, give you a view of what uh, a few of these fishing gears would look like. Um, you know, this is sort of our historic gear, been around the longest, the gill net. Uh, this is a bottom set gill net. So it's sitting on the bottom. You've got weights in the bottom of that net, floats on top. Uh, nets, you know, 2000 years ago were made out of uh, bark. Uh, now they're made out of monofilament. So 
you know, similar to what you would use on a fishing line, but woven or uh, extruded, I guess, together into this uh, diamond pattern. The fish don't see it. They can swim into it. It goes uh, past their operculum or gill coverings, and then they can't uh, back out and they're captured. Uh, there is some selectivity. You can set them in places to avoid other species you don't want to handle. Uh, also, smaller fish will, will kind of swim through there, or larger fish might not get captured. Um, this is a, a couple of uh, what a gillnet tug would look like. So you know, sort of this enclosed design uh, could be out there fishing in the winter uh, or in, in pretty harsh, con harsh conditions. Um, if you're you know, spending time in the, the gillnet tug, this is a, a trip I took uh, back in 2014. Uh, on the right side, there's this sort of circular wheel thing, and that's actually the lifter uh, that helps pull the net up. It's a hydraulic, it spins, kind of grabs the net. Uh, the net would be pushed across this table where they're dressing fish. Uh, and then, you know, people would kind of line up uh, as the net comes in, pull the fish out, put them into boxes. Uh, nets get uh, restacked into the fish box, that big black plastic box over there, uh, restacked, and then they could be. Um, reset at the end of the day. Um, you know, generally at this point, we're, we're on autopilot heading back to a port. They're able to dress those fish. Um, you know, fairly low numbers now, but uh, chubs, smoke chubs especially, look like this, uh, can fetch up to, you know, 10 or $12, which I think per pound, which is sort of this nostalgia from the time when it was a, a really abundant low price fish. Uh, now it's it's sort of a, a you know more of a, a a treat for people who remember these and you know they are tasty if you can if you can find them. Trap nets as well. So trap nets are a, a live entrapment gear. So the fish are swimming along. They run into that lead, which can be up to a thousand feet, uh, running towards shore. Uh, then they their sort of behavior is to go deep to avoid that obstacle. They don't go over it. They go deep and they head into the heart and then into the pot. And once they're in the pot, they're sort of stuck. Um, and then they swim around in the pot until uh, a boat like this, a trap net boat, uh, basically a small pilot house in front. It's basically a little room with a, uh, with a, a, a wheel and a you know, throttle, not much, not much there. And then the whole back of the boat is, is open. Uh, that's important because the, the pot is pulled over the, back of the boat, uh, fish are concentrated on one side, and then they can be sorted using a, a long dip net. Those fish are, are uh, dipped out every day or every couple days and put into uh, that fish box. And you can actually see a lake trout sticking up uh, in the middle there. Uh, we do not have a commercial harvest uh, for uh, lake trout in Lake Michigan for Wisconsin waters so that lake trout would be sorted, thrown into the water, uh, and then to swim away, grow larger, and then get caught by an angler uh, at some point. Um, so it's a, you know, allows for uh, sort of the, the sorting of these fish. And, and this is what sort of the end of the day would look like boxes of whitefish. Uh, final gear type, and this is uh, trawl, sort of more limited use, but uh, relevant to, to the study that, that I worked on. Uh, this is the Peter Paul out of Two Rivers. Um, this is a, a view of what, uh, while well, the net is uh, being brought in and uh, a catch, some of the catch of the day, fresh whitefish on the boat. So, uh, you know, that is that, you know, a couple thousand years of history. Now we're gonna dig into uh, some work that I've been working on uh, for, uh, starting in 2015. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I get to do and that I really enjoy uh, with Sea Grant is looking at applied research problems. So, uh, you know, it's not necessarily research uh, to publish a paper down the road or to, you know, understand the, you know, sort of the functioning. That's, you know, all important research, but applied research tends to be focused on specific questions um, that might be important to stakeholders. And, and for me, it was these commercial fishers uh, who were having issues. They were having trap net fouling issues. Uh, they were fishing their quota with trap nets, um, those nets were being fouled by algae. Um, and there were also angler entanglement issues. Um, you know, if you're out fishing, uh, this is basically what you see. You see these buoys. And if you don't, if you're an angler, you've got 
uh, fishing gear down in the water. If you don't know how to read what the different flags mean, the different colors, the numbers of flags, uh, you can get entangled in those, those gears, which also damages the nets. So it's kind of a lose-lose for everybody. On the fouling side, uh, you know, it's, it's really, we kind of go back to the, the non-native invasive species. Things like zebra and quagga mussels have really uh, changed the, the food web in the lake, cleared the water, because uh, they, they are filter feeders, they're eating the algae, uh, and, and the water has gotten very clear in Lake Michigan. And that means that light can get deeper in the lake. That means more of the, the bottom of the lake has enough sun to grow plants. Um, or algae. And that green that we're seeing on the beach here around those quagga mussels is actually, a, it's a native species, but it uh, becomes a nuisance. And that is called Cladophora. It is benthic. It grows attached to the bottom. As it gets uh, long, it'll kind of slough off and then start floating around. And so if you have a, a trap net out in the lake and even a gill net, um, you know, they're sitting, they're anchored in place. Uh, the Clodophora is moving with the currents, uh, generally parallel to shore, um, north and south for us in Lake Michigan. And, uh, uh, you know, in fouling up that gear and, uh, you know, causing problems for those, those trap net fishers, they have to go out, uh, you know, they would lift the nets, get the fish in the morning, go back out with a power washer and have to clean those nets. And when you've got 15 or 16 nets, um, it's a lot of pretty hard work. Um, on the angler entanglement side, you know, there's a, a gear loss issue. There's also kind of a safety issue. Uh, this is uh, what a, a trap net lead would look like on a, uh, this is actually a Lake Superior net, but you can see it's, uh, you know, about 35 feet off the bottom. So that's a, a pretty substantial um, piece of, of netting out there. And if you're, you've got your uh, cannonball off your, uh, your downrigger, um, that's you know a big lead weight keeping the the fishing gear your lures your spoons your flies down at specific depths and and a lot of times um, you know that that can kind of intersect with those nets so uh, you know one of the things that we did at Sea Grant we had a very successful program over the years uh, in the Manitowoc Two Rivers area of posting information on these nets uh, this was sort of a, an outreach uh, part of of the job that I had to do was to you know, sort of raise awareness. Um, so, you know, what is a trap net? What do these different flags mean? How do you avoid getting caught in one? Um, where are the nets? So we had, you know, sort of seasonal differences in where they could fish. Um, and, and so making anglers aware of that ahead of time uh, helped. And, and we would even provide, and this is a, you know, kind of a good partnership, I think, getting some, uh, you know, locations from the fishermen, uh, and then posting those at, at boat launch, uh, paper copies at boat launches and bait shops, you know, about a thousand a year. And then uh, online on, you know, some of the, on our website, on other websites. Uh, so we were, were pretty good reach, but, you know, things could be better. And I think uh, from the, the applied research side, um, how can we sort of reduce conflict and also improve uh, fishing ability? So, uh, Back in 2015, we, we uh, at Sea Grant worked with uh, Suzy Q Fish Company, also with the DNR to come up with a, a cooperative agreement that would allow us to conduct this study on trawling because trawling for whitefish um, you know, was not an allowed way to harvest whitefish. So we needed this uh, you know, very long legal agreement that kind of laid everything out. Uh, we developed a study plan uh, that would sort of satisfy the, the DNR's need for data. Um, and we headed out on the water um, starting in February 2015 uh, to start collecting data. This is just another view of what the net would look like. Uh, actually, that trawl net rolled up on a, a drum there and then the cod end, that white netting uh, at the back of the net, that's where you can uh, uh, empty the fish out into the deck. And um, the, the size of the mesh is important there because smaller fish can escape. So what we, we went out to, to do was to look at bycatch. So uh, non-harvested fish, what, what were those? Um, what species, what kind of numbers? Were there uh, patterns in depth? Were there patterns in season? Um, and so, uh, you know, that was me riding on the boat, working with the fishermen to collect that data. 
uh, to help the, the Department of Natural Resources make management decisions. Um, so we, we partnered with, with those fishers who historically had actually uh, got into bottom trawling with alewives, then with smelt. Um, so we did have this uh, sort of large black box here uh, between Kiwani and Sh uh, Sheboygan that um, had allowable trawling. Um, and we just were able to stay within that area, but trawl for a different species. Uh, in terms of harvest, uh, you know, what comes out, trawling, it's an effective method to harvest whitefish, um, in this area at least. Uh, you know, they have the experience, they know what the, the history is, what the, where the good areas to trawl are, so I think that was important. Um, uh, just our, our graph here, we're looking at months, monthly average, um, average harvest over time, and in general, I think the, the overall trend uh, January through July, pretty consistent harvest. There's a low period, August, September, October, um, and then uh, fishing picks up in December uh, again. And so that, that's gonna be important when we start looking at uh, sort of how decisions are made. That was uh, average daily harvest, but then harvest is, you know, there's a lot of factors that determine how many fish they wanna catch. If they don't have a, a buyer for the fish, they're not gonna harvest them. They can just leave them in the lake and catch them on another day. Uh, but we can look at uh, catch number of fish harvested per mile that helps standardize things. And in general, we've got sort of four, uh, four, different, uh, four different graphs here. And uh, this is less than 100 feet, 100 to 150 feet. And overall, most of our harvest is happening in the, those depths. Uh, March to May in our 150 feet deep to 200 feet. It's really the only time we see fish out there. And then very little uh, of any catch deeper than 200 feet. So, uh, you know, pretty useful information uh, for the fishers, for the, the department as well. And what are the other species? Because we really wanna make sure that uh, the fishery doesn't impact other species. And in general, uh, most of our bycatch is uh, whitefish and trout, uh, lake trout. Our sort of close third is uh, burbot, and then there's a mix of other species, but really uh, seen very, very uh, not that often. Uh, this is just looking at sort of three different periods of the study, um, and the percentages there are sort of the overall percentage of all the fish caught within that period. Uh, the, the bar height is actually numbers. And, you know, in general, we're, we're talking two to 3% of the total catch is bycatch. Uh, lake trout is pretty consistent throughout the study. You know, they're, they're handling about 800 lake trout a year. Uh, there is sort of this increase here in, in the whitefish returns. Uh, and those uh, were sort of unmarketable here, but then we actually saw an influx of smaller, younger fish, which, uh, you know, sort of maybe a story for another day, but, uh, you know, that's uh, an important story. There's sort of this lost lost uh, small fish for a few years for whitefish. Um, we can also look at bycatch per mile. In general, our, our lake trout on top, pretty consistent by month, um, you know, fairly consistent. Uh, the, the second here graph is, is the whitefish and, uh, you know, that is really uh, the return whitefish, similar patterns to the harvested whitefish, and then all the other species are fairly low, um, not a, a big seasonal trend. Uh, we also tagged uh, lake trout, and we had about a 7% uh, recovery rate on those, and we saw the fish uh, all over the lake. We actually had one that went all the way to Lake Huron and was caught by a commercial fisher in Ontario waters of Lake Huron. So. Um, you know, they, they do survive going through the trawl as well. Uh, how is that done to reduce angler entanglement? Well, uh, during the study, uh, as they harvested their quota through the trawl study, they did not need to set trap nets. And then by 2018, uh, 2019, 2020, they were not setting any trap nets in that area. And uh, with the trawl, they're able to fish in the winter and uh, a lot of that harvest uh, is happening uh, in the winter as well. So no overlap there. Uh, where does this stand now? Uh, the DNR was able to pass a new rule that 
uh, for 2020 to 2025, uh, this uh, trawling would be allowed. Uh, they sort of took over the, the monitoring of that. Uh, they did kind of close starting in September, October, and November uh, because of the, the results we had. And then they are using a video monitoring system as well, which is something that we sort of piloted during the study. Uh, where are we now? We're actually moved some of our efforts to uh, start a partnership with UW Green Bay, and we're looking at trap net and gill net fisheries in lower Green Bay. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll end here because I've kind of run out of time. And uh, just, you know, another area that we, we kind of talk about in, in our uh, you know, working with uh, the wild caught and the farm raised fish industries in Wisconsin is our Eat Wisconsin Fish program. So eatwisconsinfish.org, we've got recipes, we've got information on the different species, uh, we've got places that you can find them. Um, and that is, you know, another way to kind of work with the industries and uh, help people find local fish. So thanks everybody. Um, I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Titus. Um, would anybody like to start off with the uh, questions for Titus? Tom, do you want me to ex exit my, my slide here? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be fine. There we go. Good. So, Titus, um, you had those pictures of the boats from Cornucopia. Um, are the designs of those boats changing at all to shift with the fisheries, or are they pretty much that's how they are and that's what they're going to be in the foreseeable? Yeah, you know, I, I think there's a lot of kind of local flavor to a lot of these boat designs. Yeah. Uh, it sort of depends where they were built. Um, I'm part of a, another group, the Great Lakes Fisheries Heritage Trail, um, which also you can Google that if you're interested in kind of the fisheries heritage side of commercial fishing. Uh, a lot of partners in Michigan, um, but they have, you know, there, there's people who are actually studying some of these boat designs and, and restoring some of these historic uh, fish tugs. And uh, from what they say, there's, you know, sort of different lakes, different regions, even different uh, boat builders had sort of different things they were looking at. And then um, the border between Wisconsin and Michigan goes pretty much down the middle of Lake Michigan. Um, what are the legal app, uh, angles from for commercial fishing f fishers? Do they got to stay on the Wisconsin side? Can they go all the way to the Michigan side? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, the, the way the fishery in Wisconsin is managed now, uh, you know, there's sort of a zone system, which is, you know, people, if you have a license to fish in from Wisconsin, you, you can only fish in Wisconsin waters. Um, and, you know, there, there's definitely limitations uh, to how far, you know, the farther you go, the higher your fuel costs are going to be. Um, you know, I think generally people like to minimize their, their runtime out in the lake. Uh, back when the, the chub, chub was a lot there was a lot more chub fishing, you know, especially southern part of the lake, uh, Kenosha, Racine. I mean, they, they'd run 20 or 30 miles off offshore, but they would still have to stay in Wisconsin waters. Okay. And we've got a couple of um, questions from the chat, so I'll do those. And if anybody else wants to chime in with a spoken question, that'd be great. Kathleen Ott is asking, how much farmed fish is happening in Wisconsin? And if you, for me, if you could put that in the context of compared to Farm fish versus uh, Great Lakes catch, that'd be great. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a smaller issue or a smaller harvest. Um, you know, so as, as part of the Sea Grant network, you know, we, we kind of interact with, uh, you know, aquaculture fish farming folks from all over the country. And, you know, I think in general, our, our fish farming in Wisconsin is pretty small. It's a lot of kind of small small farms uh, producing, you know, 10, 10 or 15,000 pounds, you know, that might be a big one. Uh, there are some, okay. some bigger, uh, there's actually a salmon, all indoor salmon um, that grown near Eau Claire now, and they're, you know, they're up 100,000 pounds, but, you know, I think our commercial harvest out of, out of Lake Michigan, you know, at least hundreds, if not millions of pounds. So it is, a, it's a lot smaller. 
Marianne Uig asked, uh, what has been happening with getting whitefish through the ice on the Bay of Green Bay? Is there a limit? Yeah, so there, you know, there, there are sort of two winter whitefish fisheries uh, through, through the ice. There, there is a, a sort of a limited gillnet uh, commercial fishery where they can actually set those gillnets through the ice uh, and then lift them again through the ice. Uh, but uh, also in recent years, uh, there's, there's been a pretty big uh, recreational um, fishing for whitefish in Green Bay now. Uh, you know, I think part of that is, you know, perch used to be a really big fishery. Uh, perch numbers are down in Green Bay. Uh, there's a ton of walleye, not a lot of perch. Uh, you know, generally, I think we've, we've got some food web things going on there uh, because uh, walleye probably eat some of those perch. Um, but, you know, with, with lower perch numbers, there's definitely a lot more opportunities for whitefish which are doing pretty well in Green Bay right now. So there's a lot of those. There is a limit. Uh, there's sort of no size limit for the sport fish, but you can catch 10 a day. Um, and there's some pretty big guide services where you know, they'll, they've got all the, the gear, they've got the fishing spots and they'll you know, run clients out onto the lake and, and they can all, you know, a whole party can catch their, their 10 fish. So. And that's, on, that's ice fishing guided? Yep, yep. Wow. That's a big thing, you know, kind of Sturgeon Bay area. Um, I didn't know. South, yeah, they're, you know, they're catching a couple hundred thousand uh, whitefish that way in the winters now. Oh, that augurs well. Mm -hmm. um, Gareth Wyman and Todd Clark would like to ask, uh, is there no ice used in the fish boxes? How do they preserve the fish they catch and clean aboard the fish tugs? Yeah, good question. I mean, definitely icing the fish uh, rather quickly is, is important for quality and so the, really all the fish pictures that I had um, on the, the trap net days, you know, they would just pull those in, get them back to the dock really quickly um, and then dress them on shore. With the trawling, we'd, you know, fill the boxes up on the boat. They would actually dress them. So gut them, you know, slit the belly, take the guts out, and then they would ice them after that. So those tended to be longer days too with a, a trap net run, uh, you know, you'd be back at the dock in an hour or two. And uh, with trawling, you might leave at, at four in the morning and be back at noon or one, depending on what you needed to catch. Who provides the ice, if I might add? Is that a commercial or do people just have their own ice? I, I think it's probably a mix. I know they, uh, the, the company that I've been, you know, on the, the study with, they've got their own ice maker and they've got a big kind of insulated box towards the bow that they'll fill up with ice and, um, they've got enough. That's good. Uh, any other questions that people would like to ask? You can either like, chime in or uh, type it Terry, in. Terry's got a question. Good. Hi, this is Terry Geldner. I relate to you because I also live in Manitowoc on the shore of Lake Michigan and had the fortune of owning a Grady White uh, between 87 for about 15 years and I had four kids. We fished out there a lot. Some of your slides and everything was just uh, brought back a lot of memories of, of the fishing, especially when you were trolling and on your sonar, you'd come across this big collection of fish right below you. And then you realized you were over a trap. <laughs> um, thank you very much for that. It's an excellent presentation. And thanks also for your, your work in this field. What are you currently doing right now out of Manitowoc, anything specifically, or what, what's going on right now with your work? Uh, yeah, so we've, you know, as a, a fishery specialist, I, you know, I kind of touch on all of our, all of our fisheries issues, you know, Lake Michigan and Lake Superior. Um, locally, I mean, for the last seven months, I've been working out of my, my bedroom and, uh, <laughs> That's, you know, unfortunately where we've been at. So not a lot of work out in the field, but uh, we do have, a, you know, a graduate student who's been riding on uh, boats in Green Bay. Uh, she's collecting similar bycatch information. Um, I've been, uh, there's also a project down in Kenosha uh, looking at the Kenosha Dunes area and, and trying to protect that from erosion, but also uh, create some habitat. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of have my fingers in a lot of different pies and Sometimes it's hard to know what I'm, what I'm doing, so. Thank you. And thank you, Terry, for that 
insight. Glad to know you were on the lakes. Um, Marianne, you would ask another question in chat. Are the whitefish keeping the goby in check, having figured out how to consume the goby, I'm guessing? That yeah, yeah, I mean, so round, round goby is another, uh, it's a non-native species, came in in the ballast water um, and, you know, live in, in generally in kind of rocky areas. We see them a lot in, you know, port areas, like if you're fishing off the pier in, in Manitowoc, you're probably going to catch a lot of gobies. Um, Whitefish have started eating them, um, and you know that uh, is part of their diet. But uh, whitefish uh, historically would have been eating diapariah, which is actually a little amphipod. It's a, a benthic uh, invertebrate, really great food source. Um, but zebra mussels, then quagga mussels, uh, as their numbers increased, diapariah decreased. Um, and so, you know, these days, uh, go, uh, whitefish are, you know, they're eating uh, actually a lot of quagga mussels. Um, I've, I've looked through a lot of whitefish stomachs and you certainly see some gobies in there, uh, but you see a lot of invertebrates, midge larva, a lot of quagga mussels, um, which is kind of a lower quality food, but it is abundant. Um, gobies are also, you know, lots of other species, uh, lake trout, brown trout especially have really, uh, kind of honed in on on the the round goby as a food source uh, to the the point where uh, maybe their numbers are kind of low. Um, you know, one of the challenges with knowing how many gobies there are is that they're really hard to survey. Um, USGS U.S. Geological Survey goes out uh, every year, um, and they do bottom trawls for those little forage fish, the food. Uh, they also do. Uh, acoustic surveys, which are like, you know, a $30,000 fish finder. And, uh, you know, they can survey uh, kind of all the areas that the gobies aren't abundant. Um, and because the gobies like uh, rocky areas, and if you run a, a, a bottom trawl through a rocky area, you wreck your bottom trawl. So um, we're not even sure how many gobies are out there, but it is definitely something people are interested in, and they have become an important part of the, the food web. Uh, and then Kathleen Ott has asked in the chat, the salmon spawn here, are they still being stocked? Yeah, so, you know, they're, they're sort of, we, in Wisconsin, or in Lake Michigan, at least, we have, you know, four different states um, that stock uh, salmon into the lake. Um, there has been a lot of work in recent years. Uh, you know, if you, if you go out on like a charter fishing trip right now, or you have your own boat, and if you catch a Chinook salmon, uh, there's about a 60% chance that that is a wild reproduced Chinook salmon, probably from the Michigan side of the lake where they have lots of national forests. They have beautiful, clean, clean rivers and streams, lots of good uh, habitat. Uh, they might have also come out of uh, the Canadian side of Lake Huron, which has you know, lots of trees, um, lots of great habitat. Um, so there is still stocking and, and definitely for us on the Wisconsin side, uh, you know, the, the fall fishery for Chinook and other returning salmon, that is really, for us in Wisconsin, it's, it's the stocking that, that makes that possible because the, the fish are stocked in our ports and they're really uh, spread up and down, up and down Wisconsin areas uh, so that they'll kind of return to the area they were stocked in. So stocking is, is definitely still a, a, a part of the, how the fishery is managed. And really it's, it's one of the few things that, you know, the, the, we as people can really, you know, it's one of the levers we can pull. We can either put more stocked fish in or less. Um, it, the, the hard thing is getting everyone to, degree, to agree how many and what species we should put in and where. But that fortunately isn't something I have to worry about. Uh, Jeff Weber just asked on the chat, and go ahead, you can either, um, you can also chime in if you want to unmute yourself, um, just reading the ones from the chat. Jeff Weber is asking, I paddle sea kayaks in the Apostle Islands. Did you say the fishing tugs return on autopilot? In other words, no one on watch? Uh, they can. I, you know, I think in the Apostle Islands, um, I don't, you know, there's enough boat traffic. The The trip that I was referring to was in February when we, you know, even the commercial, like the, the freighters weren't running, we were the only boat out on Lake Michigan. And I think it was like 20 degrees below zero. So 
I think our 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 risk of uh, encountering sea kayaks was pretty low that day. Um, and you know the 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 Linda E was uh, people might remember the Linda E story, which was uh, uh, 20 or 30 years ago now was uh, a chub boat running back uh, towards Milwaukee and actually uh, collided and sank with uh, an Am Amoco uh, oil tanker out in Lake Michigan. Uh, apparently everyone was on autopilot and uh, and yeah that whole that whole crew was lost uh, really unfortunate oh other questions uh, a few minutes ago you mentioned that um, one of the fish or several of the fish eat quagga mussels can you tell me how that works um, seems to me that'd be like eating a rock yeah, I mean, uh, that's the whitefish of, you know, I, I've, I don't have solid numbers on it, but, you know, whether or not they're targeting the quagga mussels or they're just, uh, you know, feeding around them, I think it's a, probably a combination. Uh, those quagga mussel beds are, are sort of these like mini habitats where uh, midge larvae, you know, are, are really abundant in there. So I think that's a food source. Quagga mussels are in there too. And you know, quagga mussel shells are actually pretty, pretty brittle. Um, you know, they're fairly easy to crush. So uh, I think for them, and, and they're, when, when zebra mussels and quagga mussels actually arrive, there's some interesting stories of, uh, you know, observations from the commercial fishery where, you know, these, these white fish were, were just super skinny. They were trying to eat, you know, the mussels because they were abundant and they were like, you know, tearing their stomachs and, uh, it seems like they have, you know, with a lot of these new food sources, it takes, you know, a decade or two to either recognize that it's a food source and then to sort of adapt to feeding on it. It seems like uh, their their whole digestive system is a bit more muscular now um, in the lake whitefish, uh, so they're feeding on those those mussels more. Is anybody doing uh, genetics uh, on that? I'm, is it a are whitefish a generation a year? In other words, you'd get 10 years, uh, 10 generations of selection on that, or who does genetics on uh, that kind of fish? Uh, there, are, I mean, there, there's interest in the genetics. Um, a lot of that is kind of for the management and the different stocks. So uh, whitefish are, they're actually a migratory species when it comes to spawning. So the, the fish down by us in two rivers in Manitowoc, uh, and, and we would actually see this in the data where they start shifting into shallower water later in the summer. Uh, and then they, they actually head north um, and, and some of the efforts in recent years where they were tagging these whitefish on their spawning grounds, uh, the tag returns that we see down in two rivers are a combination of uh, near Bailey's Harbor, uh, North May Bay, Moonlight Bay is a really big uh, sort of important uh, lake whitefish spawning. Uh, and then we see a lot of fish from Bay to Knock uh, in the Michigan, in the very northern part of uh, Green Bay uh, is a, an important uh, spawning area for our fish as well. Uh, another interesting story with whitefish though, um, you know, historically they spawn in rivers uh, throughout Green Bay, but you know, as, as water quality was really poor, lots of paper mills, uh, in the last decade or so, as water quality has improved enough, we're actually seeing uh, you know, the, the whitefish have discovered that they can actually spawn in these uh, rivers again. And we've got, uh, you know, spawning populations in the Menominee River, Peshtigo, Acanto, and even in the Fox uh, up to the De Pere Dam. Yeah. Um, and they are successfully spawning. And that's sort of a new question for research. Um, you know, what is the, the, how much do these river reproduction support the fishery or the sport fishery? And uh, what about the kind of the reef, the, you know, the typical reef spawning that we have both in the Bay and in, in Lake Michigan. Are there any other questions anybody would like to ask either in the chat or by speaking up? No, I had one more. I think I saw an article just last week about, um, I think it was the Red Cliff Band having a new fishery, uh, sustainable fishery, Am I remembering that correctly? And if so, can you tell me more about that? I don't know. I'll have to read that. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, Red Cliff has, uh, they've got a, a commercial fishery that they 
they regulate, you know, the tribes are sovereign nations, so they sort of regulate their own uh, their own commercial fisheries up there. Uh, there's also the state state licensed fisheries uh, that the DNR manages. But I know a, a few years ago, Redcliffe was looking at uh, maybe doing more of their own processing in-house and, and more marketing. Yeah, and I, it was just something uh, that I came across and I don't know if it was on a search and it could have been two or three or four years ago or in a Twitter feed. But I, since this was coming up, it clicked in my head. So that's pretty mm -hmm. good. Yeah, I mean, COVID's been pretty interesting for a lot of these, uh, you know, the the past markets were, you know, to, directly to restaurants, uh, you know, or out to the, the East Coast. And, you know, as a lot of restaurants shut down, um, you know, the, those markets have changed. And, uh, you know, definitely for a lot of fisheries now, if you can market direct to consumers, um, it's a great way to go. Uh, are there any other questions then? Uh, if not, what I'm going to do is uh, stop the recording and then we can go into the linger at the lectern if anybody'd like to chat um, without being recorded with Titus, that'd be great. <laughs>